you put for elderly women up in the forefront that was unheard of in the region. Nobody had looked at doing um, animation as a major project here, and you kind of dove in head first. Uh, how did you come up, first of all, with the concept of being for elderly women? I think uh, in the beginning, I think it was bound to happen if it was not me, somebody else. I think we kind of, a few shows, uh, myself and Shabir Kartoum, like a form of animation also, was not in the same uh, year, but I was more of a full product and uh, Haider's work was uh, a two-minute uh, competition. But the idea of uh, creating a fridge, fridge was not called fridge, it was called the Mugamarat, is the Adventures of the Old Ladies, and because of a, probably like a typo or a mistake in, with, the, with the production company, they started naming it fridge. Um, and um, it started when I was in the States, I studied at Northeastern University of Boston and I was asked to create a superhero character that is based uh, from my culture and uh, I, start, I started drawing the Aladdins and the Alibabas and you know, the capes and all the superheroes and uh, the, our professor said, no, I saw this before, it was done by Disney before, that kind of character I know. I want, to, I want you to sketch something that relates to you now. And unfortunately, uh, back then, uh, we, I did not feel that I had any superhero that I can relate to in our region. If you are a CEO or studying business, you have so many CEOs that can be your superheroes. But uh, uh, as an artist, I don't have somebody to look up to. And then I started to look a little bit back at our history. And uh, something strange, because we were at the, in a very male dominant kind of society, so the role of women is very, very important, yet we don't hear of it a lot. So all the, all we can see, I see a lot of uh, <coughs> programs about my grandfather's handing of sharks as they die for, pearl, pearl, for pearls, and we don't have sharks in these regions. Like, to hand off, <laughs> they glorify our grandfathers a lot. And then my grandmother, who was raising 10 kids in the heat, uh, with no money, no oil, no nothing, no, you know, she, she's, she was raising them, and she, like, and my father is a testament of, of her raising. And I find that she's physically unique because of the mask she's wearing. Uh, she is uh, also genuine in the, uh, in the fact that she is a storyteller, somebody who can, I always say this, a grandmother will manage to advise you and insult you in the same sentence. <laughs> very, very unique like that. And when I sketched my first character, uh, it was Om Sa'id. Om, Om means the mother of, and as you know here, it's a sign of respect if you call each uh, lady by their son's name. And the professor goes like, wow, you sketched the duck. <laughs> no, no. no, but then I explained that, and he loved what, uh, you know, what this stands for. And, I mean, at the time that Farij came out, uh, it, specifically with the generation, that the young generation, that their link to our culture was held by a very fine, thin tether. Um, now it's moving on, by the way. <laughs> Is it? I thought, I thought what you did actually brought it back. They started taking a lot of the culture that they see you juxtaposed, yeah. Yeah, just with the intro of Ridge, you juxtaposed the modern side of Dubai with the, with the old Dubai. I think what Ridge managed to do, not, not because of the content, well, because of the content, but it managed to bring the grandmother, uh, different audiences, so the grandmothers, the grandfather division, the mothers and the fathers and their sons together and then when they watched there was a dialogue so there was an exchange we never gave them a platform to exchange uh, a lot of information and uh, that was happening while fridge was taking place because once you recite the poetry by one uh, poem by one of the characters they go like what's that word and this happens or if you are like trying to learn something uh, uh, for the grandmothers you know th so there's a lot of information exchange that was happening during the show because all of these usually you don't sit to watch TV together, you know this, and all around. So unless there is a common subject which Fridge brought, uh, I think that's I think that's the most important thing that Fridge did. You know, I don't think the comedy or the animation side of it or anything. It's about just giving an opportunity for all of us to meet and discuss something that we have in common. And then that opened the door to many other artists who suddenly saw that there is
there's opportunity in this field. It doesn't need to be just a hobby, um, such as Khaled. Khaled, how did you pursue your dream? And how did you come to the decision that I don't want this government job, I want to go ahead and become an artist? Uh, see, Fareed did play the big part of it, by the way, because before Fareed, whenever I thought they were going to be an animation ever, like, I thought it was just something that we were going to see you know, American media create all the time, or Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it, we're just going to sit and watch until Fereej came along. And that actually gave me a little bit of push. But also it's, uh, see, I don't know if you guys can relate to this. Like, I, uh, the routine kind of with the government job at some point. Uh, I remember I woke up in the morning and I started thinking, you know, should I pretend I'm sick today? Or I said the flu last week, so it's not going to make sense to say like I have the flu and not go to work. But then it hit me actually, I was like, you know what, if I don't like my job, why am I in it? And for the first time, I actually went to work with a big smile on my face. And I went to them and I told them, yeah, I'm quitting my job. I was like, why? They said, no, I just, I don't feel like I belong to this job. And I went to the Japanese embassy on the same day. I actually left work out the Japanese embassy. And I asked about a scholarship, if there is a scholarship. And they said, Okay, there might be a scholarship, but you have to submit everything by Sunday. And that one was the weekend at the time. So I had to do the physical, I had to write an essay, I had to do all of that. And I remember at the time my father was sick, so I was in the hospital on the floor, sitting and typing everything and writing it down. And I did the physical in the hospital because, you know, it's convenient. I was sitting in the hospital that day. So uh, as soon as I went and I applied, and they told me, by the way, you're very lucky. I'm like what? I said just half an hour before you came in and you asked about this, the guy that we we're supposed to take to Japan canceled. Oh. God, oh, okay, this is meant to be. So I packed my bag and went to Japan, and uh, I, it was it was a blast. I learned so much from it. It was it changed me completely from the spoiled guy with the fancy cars and a lot of money and all of that. I worked at Starbucks at some point in Japan. I worked as a waiter in a restaurant and I I was an English teacher for kindergarten kids. A lot of kids actually first grade kids. So it's just you learn a lot from life. And uh, that's what Japan gave me. And also to add the manga culture too. And you're bringing kind of a new side of animation for this region which is science fiction animation. Um, what are some of the obstacles you faced in trying to bring that to the culture here, trying to expose them to it? Uh, they're, all I can say is that they're not ready for it yet. It's still not there. The science fiction culture is not even close to being ready in this region. At some point, I remember I was pitching to companies and TV stations and all of that, and they want to tell you no, but they don't want to say it. So, and if, for example, this has actually happened. I was pitching, one of the characters' name is uh, Big Salem, in Arabic it's like Salim al you know? So he was like, uh, after the pitch, and after I finished everything, he was like, yeah, so why did you call him Salim? I was like, uh, okay, I changed his name to Salim now. His name is Salim. He's like, yeah, but why Salim? like, no, no, his name is Salim. He said, yeah, but why? <laughs> so he just wants to tell you no, but without saying no. So I just closed the laptop and he was like, mm, thank you very much for the meeting. It just usually it keeps going the same way. Whatever it is that we try to do when it comes to pitching an idea for science fiction, it's just, I don't think the culture is there yet. And how did you come up with Nasus for uh, Sigur? Uh, that one, see, I, I thought I was really going to write something when uh, an incident happened. Uh, one of our professors in Japan, university, he was excited, he was happy, and he said, you know, I wrote something new about you guys today. I'm like, okay, sure, what is it? He said, I know the difference between an Arab and a Muslim. <laughs> so I started laughing, see, that was my reaction. <laughs> I started laughing, I'm like, he said, why are you laughing? I said, you know, because you should know, you're, you're a teacher, you should know this. He said, yeah, but why should I? He said, what did you bring in? Show me something that you guys did, because how do you know about cultures? It's through media. That's how you know about culture. Said all I know is what you know the American media is showing me all the time. I don't know anything about it. So, well, you know what? I'll show you something. So I went and showed the fridge, <laughs> 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 and he looked at it and he was like, "Okay, so 
how do they transform? I'm like, what do you mean transform? Said, how do they turn to falcons? <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, you know, the thing on the nose, which is, oh, right. yeah. It's better than a duck, though, no? Huh? It's better than a duck. Yeah, it's better than a duck. Yeah, so he said, like, you know, how do I, I thought, no, that's something that all the ladies were like, okay, look, I see it, I, I see what your point is, but that is way too deep into the culture for me. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I just realized that there's a difference between Arab and a Muslim, and now you're showing me how all the ladies behave just too soon. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that's how you actually teach people about it. Like, people really don't know anything about this region except, you know, the Ghitra, the Agal, and then they always show it wrong in Hollywood, by the way. Not even a single movie showed it right. <laughs> not even a single movie. And with the Arabic, when they have the Arabic there, like, oh, ha, 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 it's not even Arabic. <laughs> you see it. You see that in movies all the time. So I thought this is the way to show something, to show, you know, a little bit of our culture, but through sci-fi, through something really hip, something really cool, something full of action. Something more directed at adults than kids. Can I, can I just... Uh, add to your point, by, and, and this is like an advice to everyone. Uh, sometimes we, we, we do go to people who we are assuming are the right people to support us, you know, whether it's a governmental entity, funding box, anything. And yes, they'll be sitting there, sitting there and they have to acknowledge if this is a great idea, they'll tell you it's a great idea, we love this idea. But are they willing to put a dirham on it? No. The thing is, they want you to come back, and this is something I learned from Fridge and other projects. When you go, you don't go showing the product. You need to show how the product will make money. That's what they care about, to be honest with you. These, 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 you as much as they tell you we love culture and we love art and the salad samia, it's like it does not work. You go there and you tell them, listen, this is a project, I'll tell you about it later, but this is how much it will make. And, and, uh, and you start, because they worry, these people are, are and, uh, they're enlisted by the government to give you money so they can make money and have a success story. TV stations are, are a very, very good example uh, because they're very slow in catching trends and uh, they always play it safe, especially the ones, the regional, play, the regional players here. Now I think having Netflix coming in and all of those guys coming in will help a little bit, keeping our guys on, on their toes. But uh, that's the problem. It's, it's not just convincing them about the product, it's about really telling them how this will make this much money from these venues. And then they'll probably say, no, I don't. That's what happened. But since you know, it's a, there's a different note as well. <laughs> so then how did you manage to convince Marvel to go with... Yeah, I really yeah. know that, by the way. Yeah. Just went to... It's funny because you talk about money because that's really fundamentally what Marvel cares about too. Like if you're not going to make money for the company, your issue, your character is going to be dead. Like you can't do anything uh, beyond a certain number of issues. So um, with with Ms. Marvel, you know, I think a part of it was luck <coughs> and um, it, me being a little stubborn to an extent. But I will say Marvel is has always been... Um, really all embracing of like taking chances like this. Like this is really interesting, this is a part of our DNA is to do something that's slightly outside of the box, um, but still very true to who we are with with, um, with Ms. Marvel uh, being just a young kid who has a bunch of insecurities and she wants to figure out who she is. So, you know, when I pitched it, they were really um, on board immediately. You know, the biggest, the biggest struggle was at that time we were not selling that many female-led titles. Um, we had just launched the first female-led title, Captain Marvel, um, after five years of not having any any female-led titles on the stand. We had only male-driven comics, and because the audience was just not there. So what we found was we just had a really direct engagement process with our audience. Like, I would go to panels and conventions and I started doing Women of Marvel panels and talking to them, and for whatever reason, people started responding, and, and I was very blunt with our fans. I was like, hey, listen guys, if you really want more female-led content, you want more diverse content, you have to go out and buy it. Like, we are still, we are a business, so go buy it, and then maybe buy another copy or another two copies, and go give it to your friends, and this is how you support it. And I, you know, Literally a year later, 
and this is right after Captain Marvel came out and people were so excited about it, we actually had signi- our sales like skyrocketed to the point where I could get a Ms. Marvel out, um, to the point where we were up to 23 female-led titles. So it is a constant back and forth with the community. Like, you know, a lot of times audiences and communities expect the creators to create and create for them, but we forget it's, 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 it's a constant exchange um, of commerce and ideas and us supporting one another, us trying to showcase all of your experiences and do it in a way that's authentic and honest and engaging and fun. Um, and then at the same time, hopefully audiences responding and, and believing in an idea um, and believing it with their dollars. That's really what it, what it comes down to. Um, so we've been very lucky that it has still been successful. But that's, it's, at the end of the day, no matter how many stories we tell, we are still, we are still a business. And that's so sad, I hate to be so crass. But that's just, that's no, I think it's okay yeah. to have to be a business and to be yeah. also. I, I think they work together. They need to be together. Yeah. But we 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 need to understand that I it's, I know many artists who are like you know they're like they're very in the artist artistic field that they forget about the business side yeah, yeah. and the importance of having that and learning the lingo so we can like challenge. Mother's telling me, well, tell me this, how does this make money? How does this, yeah. how can I spend this around? And you need to be ready because unfortunately, if you want, if you're coming with such unique ideas, fresh ideas and putting them in, in a market like this, they, they, they freak out, they freak out. Yeah. So you need to show them the opportunities. Yeah. And I know Marvel is moving ahead, putting a lot of minorities in the forefront um, with Spider-Man, with Captain America. Um, how important is that to you? I mean, incredibly important. I feel like it's important for everyone here. I feel like uh, the, I think that the future of all entertainment has to be one that is truly representative of the world and everyone's experiences. And you know, and we're all very familiar with the way the media has portrayed uh, Muslims in particular, but has portrayed really any minority out there. Um, there's a sense of fear and danger. And I know living in America, for me, it's 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 very cute at the moment. Um, so we combat that through the stories we tell, and specifically through stories like, you know, a Miles Morales Spider-Man and a Ms. Marvel Kamala Khan um, and a Sam Wilson Captain America. I mean, those are the things that we're doing to sort of, you know, subvert people's expectations of what it means to be popular and uh, a popular icon and a popular superhero. Um, and it's been working for us for, for, for the most part, and, and you know that's something I'm going to continue to engage with um, as, <laughs> as long as it makes us some money. <laughs> what was the reaction of some of the people who are attached to these characters? You know, they're attached to Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and, and then you, they see that you guys are changing things up on them. How, how was that feedback? They were really angry, yeah. There's a lot of people out there who are not happy that we've changed the status quo, right? Like, these are characters everyone has grown up with. Um, their whole lives, right? And so we're going in and saying, oh no, but there's this other Spider-Man here. Uh, you know, just deal with it. And you know, and, and people feel like you're changing these really sacred treasures of theirs. And like Thor. Like, sorry? The woman. Thor. Thor is a woman, yes. Jane Foster Thor. That, yeah, we're, we're, we've done it with almost every single one of our characters. <laughs> and people are so mad. They're so mad. Um, but the toy box is really big, and that's all we want to show them. And we want to remind people that like these characters um, should not be defined by race or gender or ethnicity. Like they are, like they represent these really great ideals, right? Like Thor is not a gender, right? You know, Captain America is not a race, um, and people should be aware of that. And that's why it's all the more important to put different people in those mantles and those shoes. Um, Khaled, you were talking about having a hard time getting funding here and stuff. Have you looked at maybe taking the culture here, like you said you were talking to your professor in Japan, taking the culture here to, to the outside market, taking it to Japan, to the States, and seeing how they can react to it now that Marvel has just about opened the door for you guys? See, globalization is real, whether we like it or not. It's just it's something that's so easy to put your ideas across. All you have to do is just send an email. So why is trip yourself to the UAE? The UAE is such a small market. Let's just say we did an animated series, for example, and every single person they he saw it. That's still not enough. We not just we're a small country; we're a small population. Like the, even the population is not that high. 
So you need to go to a bigger market if you want to make your money back, the money you spend. So I think the opportunities for you to pitch it outside, it's a lot better and it looks better and better every day. And for example, um, if you pitch something for, uh, plus also especially with the comic, the comic community, they're quite open-minded. Like you, you can get a really good idea. Just they're not gonna care so much about what's going behind. For example, Miss Marvel. They really love the concept of Miss Marvel. They really like the character, and most the majority of people they didn't care like the fact that she's a Muslim or something. They didn't care so much because the storyline is good. That gives us an opportunity that if we wrote a really cool storyline and if we pitch it abroad, that could go somewhere. And uh, it's just it's all about a matter of trying. Just all you need to do is just give it a try. In Japan, uh, in Japan, I met with uh, some of the publishers. All we had to do is just send them an email or give them a phone call. I'm like, yeah, we have an idea you want to pitch. Okay, sure. Is this day good for you? Yeah, sure. Okay, come. That's it. That's how easy it is in Japan. They say no, of course, but still. <laughs> still get to go there. <laughs> yeah, still, but they but they really give you really really good tips. They give you like, okay, you gotta work on this one, you gotta work on that one, and come in again, to pitch it again, because they know they can make money out of it. They really want the content, and you have the content, so that's a they have a huge comics audience, yeah. Japan, and China is also growing, but East Asia is it's a huge emerging market when it comes right. to comics content, so that's a really interesting, I mean, it's a good place to go, but an interesting business model to try and attempt yeah. to follow. Yeah, absolutely. Mohammed, um, when it comes to animation, do you delve into the Khalid Gibran's The Prophet, that was something that I wouldn't consider to be a visual way. How did you guys transform that into an animation? How do you see that working within the different cultures? Okay, Com first thing, confession, I've never read the book before we approached. Because we, because no, no, wait, wait, wait. And something that book was banned uh, here. Uh, yeah, it was not part of the. Um, we never got this book. We never worked on this book, and uh, it was available in bookstores. Here. Well, now, yeah. uh, and um, and up until on, you know, it was available online. You can see and you can see it, but but back then we did not have access to it. And okay, I might not look that old, but. They never taught us these things, they never got, gave us books to read on the side. We never were into that whole, let's read on the side exercise. thing is, Khalil Gibran's writings come in a certain way. I mean, he has a certain style. And it takes time to really understand and grasp what he's trying to say. So I think I remember when they first gave me um, the, my poem, it was Crime and Punishment. Now, I, I ended up being good and evil. But it was my punishment, was crime and punishment in the beginning. <laughs> so I, had my, I had my team come in and uh, we were like 21 people. I don't know if you were with us back, back in the day. No. Yeah. Okay, so my team, sorry. Yeah, so I gathered my team. We sat in front of each other and in front of, uh, I sat in front of them and I was like, and I read, read, the, 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 read the chapter and I was like, do you understand what he's saying? Because I have no idea. <laughs> and then we had to like to Google, Facebook for, for dummies, we, 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 we managed to, but because it's the style. And then it kind of, I, I totally got the style, and I understand, I was like amazed by how he is actually trying to be um, expressive in his, uh, in his thoughts, and, and how he's saying things, and I, I got really hooked, and I read the rest of them, and, and when I was really excited about my chapter, they was like, okay, no, we cancel the crime and punishment, you're doing good to me. And uh, the, my, my biggest fear, honestly, coming to an animation point of view, I was the only Arab on the, on, the, on the whole project. So everybody else was like, you have Tom Moore, you have, uh, of course, Roger Adders, and, uh, you know, the, the whole bunch are either nominated for an Oscar or an Emmy, some people won, and they don't know me. Like, they don't know me. My name was, like, I remember my first Skype with Roger was like, I'm explaining my concept, and they're like, just staring at me. Like, and I was like, I feel, I feel, I was like, no, you know, I don't belong here. You know, I was like somebody who was pushed. And I thought this would be a very big challenge for me because I came from, um, you know, TV background, 3D animation. My piece was 2D watercolor. Like I went totally the other side, and um, I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to do something super artistic, 
uh, because the words were beautifully artistic. And I said, uh, you know, let's do, and we decided to do uh, aquarelle, which is watercolor. So basically we, we spent three years making this piece that lasted three and a half minutes. Three, three years, frame by frame, and I did not paint anything, <laughs> you know. But this uh, piece, if you see, if you Google, if you Google the trailer or you go home and watch the, the, the film, uh, you will notice that my chapter has uh, an homage to the Arabic language. Uh, with the calligraphy on the stag's horns. So you see the letter Noon shows up and you, you can, it's a familiar look when you, if you're not Arabic, you can tell this is a calligraphy. And I wanted just to celebrate the, the language uh, of, uh, of, of course, Khalid Jorah in English, but uh, the, the Arabic language, and this is an Arabic writer. So the, there was so, so many beautiful things that came together, but yeah. Yeah, big contrast from comedy to something very super serious, but I'm happy I survived. <laughs> Took some medication, but I... <laughs> uh, no, you said like you went from something very artistic that you weren't exposed to, you weren't exposed to the book, to the poetry. Um, how do you take animation and expose people to those aspects that they're not exposed to? And the same thing with comics. How do you take um, arts and culture and present it to people for the first time. Just, for, just to add on that, for Fridge, for example, when we started, it was comedy, 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 ha ha, laugh, laugh. The, 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 the last season and the one before, we decided to go towards themes that are serious. And I had, I had episodes where people were crying. Like, and, and I love that because if they cry or touch, if they were touched, it means the characters have passed that threshold of believability. You killed off a character. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I almost did that. No, but you know, that those moments, there are sad moments that come and you go like, whoa, I did not expect that coming. Like, and you feel it. And, and, and the fact that a, a cartoon show or an animation can do that, then, then it's, it, 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 it means that it has, you know, all the wires now connected to the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's a great thing to have if you manage to make your, the platform of the format definitely can make that. I remember seeing the Iron Giant, um, and I was crying by the end of that movie, so I'm sure that with Marvel and uh, what Hamad, uh, what Hamad, uh, so uh, there are similar things. Definitely. Well, you know, with what we try to do, I mean, specifically, what, what I love to say about comics and what we do is that we, we end up um, educating audiences by distracting them with entertainment, right? And distracting them with just really funny and quirky characters, and inspiring characters, but quirky characters. So, you know, the way, you know, comics has been really interesting in the States because we have had a resurgence of comics readers, and a lot of it has to be, is, is because of the films that have come out, um, and a lot of it is because we have these really great diverse characters. Um, but what has really worked for us, I think, fundamentally, and how we've gotten so many people outside of just Muslims reading them as Marvel comic book, um, is the fact that I think we tell stories in a way that isn't overly didactic. Like, we're not trying to go in and say, hey world, Muslims are not terrorists. Check out Ms. Marvel, look, she's good. Like, that's just the worst way yeah, to that's tell. That's what they want us to do here. Yeah. They want us to do that. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you know, it's too, you don't want to hammer it on the head, and you don't want to be too overt about your messaging. You don't want to say we're breaking stereotypes here. Um, you know, Willow and I, Willow was actually, I was talking to Willow, um, like, a, maybe a couple weeks ago about this, but we realized that we had not said the word Muslim or Islam for 19 issues of the comic book. Everyone knew what her experience was, but it was all in the subtle, in the nuances of uh, the characters interacting with one another, the elements in the background, about her going to mosque and talking about her life and not necessarily worrying about what's happening around her. Her questioning her religion in the middle of an, a lecture with an imam and continuing on in her life. And that was just like a beat. It was a beat within the story and I, I think the only way that you can really get audiences to know a certain experience is if you tell it through the lens of that experience versus making it, just making the story about that experience, you know? Like, I think you have to do, it's all in the rendering, and that's really what has worked for us. Um, because we're not telling a story just about, you know, 
this woman as a Muslim and all the things that she's going through. You know, the thing that I, the story I hate that I'm so tired of in the Muslim narrative is the Muslims experience post 9-11. I, I don't want to hear that anymore. I, I want to hear about Muslims going out to dinner and really craving a BLT sandwich, which is the first panel of Ms. Marvel, right? It's, it's her just being like, I'm really curious about what bacon tastes like, you know? Like, I really just want to go to a party with all of my friends, but I can't. Um, you know, those are the mundane experiences that make us human beings, make us really connect with one another on a very basic human level. And then people will be like, oh yeah, she's Muslim, by the way. Oh, interesting. I didn't, I get yeah, cool, she's just like me. And, and that's really what our, our, our intention is. I think that's, those are the best kinds of stories. Um, it's, it's just not trying to be too, too over the head, too, too overt about it. You had a little bit of sprinkling of the Pakistani culture in there, if you were to work, yeah. things like that. Um, did that kind of confuse any of your readers, or did that make them more want to look into that culture? Yeah, you know, I, at first we thought it would. Like, every so often we'd have a definition, and then sometimes I'm like, no, we should just keep going through and just let it be a part of the conversation. Um, and a lot of times people, would it wouldn't affect them, or they would infer what it meant. Like, they would infer that something meant uncle or aunt or, um, you know, just really small little phrases that people started understanding. And there's little things like inshallah and mashallah that kind of are also sprinkled throughout um, that people have an understanding. And a lot of people who didn't know what it was uh, would actually go and look, look it up. Um, so I feel like we're educating them in that way too. So, yeah. That's cool. Um, so looking at how comics started evolving from its golden age, which was very basic and on the surface, and slowly we started seeing, you know, with, uh, with Vietnam and stuff, we're starting to see um, a little bit of uh, societal issues coming into comic books. And then the complete transformation of Alan Moore's Watchmen, that yeah. book, just the surface value of comics and made it more psychological, uh, made it deeper, to look into the humanity of superheroes, basically, um, changing the way stories are told in comics. Um, do you guys feel that there's any social issues that need to be brought through that medium in this region? Uh, there's a lot of issues that could be said. Definitely, <laughs> that's, that's obvious. And uh, yeah, for example, one of the issues that I remember one time I had a friend coming in from Japan, and we were sitting in a restaurant, and there were a group of local women. One of them is putting the shale on her shoulder; the other one's wearing half a shale and a wig with the hair. And the other one was doing in the car, and it's absolutely normal, and they just hanging out. And uh, my Japanese was like, is that okay? How do they hang out with each other? Can they? She sees something off to her, but that's totally normal here. We don't have that much of an issue when it comes to whatever it is that you wear. We have the freedom. Abaya, it used to be something that you cover up the body at the, uh, before. Now it's a fashion statement. Now it's something, you look at the Abaya, it's an art piece. It's beautiful. It's absolutely fantastic. And, but the world is not exposed to that. And uh, we definitely have a lot of things that we could share to the world, especially about our culture here. The more people know about it, and uh, media is the best way, is the only way actually to share those moments, just share those experiences. Do you know what throws them off? When it comes like, uh, they want to know if they can shake a woman's hand. Yeah. Oh man, I saw, yes. I, I've seen things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, hey, she shakes hands, and she shakes hands, and then he comes to the next one, no, I don't shake hands. Yeah. Like, when do you know? And because you don't know, girls, they, they act like, you can tell if, yeah. well, if she raises her hand, then, yeah. you know, you can tell with body language. So you just wait for the girl to actually. Oh, yeah, I, wait, I wait for the guy, though. You do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like recruiting, I'm like recruiting no, no, for everyone. You know, I the girl is like, she almost wants to hug you, and then she's like, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so that throws you out big time. Yeah, no, I, screwed, I screwed it up. My bad. Um, well, I have a controversial question, not to take the moderator out of this. So what, I mean, but specifically within, like, within the Emirates, within sort of Arab culture, do you think that there's issues that you would be addressing for this particular community, like social issues? No. Uh, there's a lot of Yeah, but I mean, how you, would you go about doing that? Okay, do you remember our conversation earlier today when we were talking about how being stereotyped? 
as Imara. Sure. Like, and do not make any Marathi angry. We are, you know, we do not work as hard as everybody else. We are rich, all of us. And we have a lot of, we don't have any problems in the world. And, you know, there's just certain stereotypes that people really believe because yeah. it's the easy way to deal with any Marathi. Also, one thing that you mentioned, you were here for six months and you haven't met any Marathi. I met one. Yeah, you met one. Okay. Well, because they told me to, if you ever meet an Amirati, just don't make them angry. Yeah. See, that's what... the best thing that I've to do. So you gotta change those You're still here, like, you're not going to all nationalities. Yes, definitely. People are angry. What the nationality that you can go for and you piss them off? That doesn't happen. Maybe oh, Japanese, though. They never they, get angry. They, they, they scared me. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't get in an accident with it. Emirati, and I was like, okay, we'll never drive. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Change that stereotype. See, that's not just one. There's so many other stereotypes. Yeah. I, I swear to God, one time I had this, uh, I met this guy from Lebanon, and he said, okay, can we have a coffee, please? Can we sit in the coffee shop, just have a coffee? And we sat, and he started asking me all of those questions as if I'm an alien from another planet. <laughs> He's like, what do you wear under this? What is that like? How does that one look like? Do you guys really do this? Do you really have a Ferrari at home? Yeah. Is your dad really that rich? Is it that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You should already know some of these answers. <laughs> See, that's the thing. But again, what does our media show? Look at our Khadiji shows. I swear to God, there was this one movie, a Kuwaiti movie, okay? And this has happened on TV. I couldn't, it was in the cinema, actually. I saw it, and I could not believe what I'm looking at. There was this guy driving his car and he's doing donuts on the road. So the police came in and they were like, oh my God, I cannot believe those young kids these days and they're doing all those moves. The government provided them with some areas where they can practice their hobbies in a safe environment and all. Like, oh my God, talk a lot simple. Wow. Yeah, they said it literally just like that. And, and, <laughs> we have a very long way to go. Yeah, exactly, very long way to go. And uh, look at the Khaliji shows. Everybody's yelling all the time. We don't have a normal conversation. We're always yelling. <laughs> yeah, even, if you, even if you want to say something nice to somebody, and you do that. By the way, there's something that we still do. I think it stopped in the States, in, I don't know, in the 70s maybe. When two people having a conversation, the guy turns his back and talks to the wall while the woman is behind him. I do that in my show, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then they turn to the other side. I, 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 I know it defies, it defies logic, uh, but uh, it, 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 um, it's the composition of the scene. And I do the comics as well, by the way. I do the comics. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's a moment. 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 And everybody's listening, like, I, I, I tried it with a friend of mine, and I looked at the wall, and I started talking to him, he cannot hear me clearly. He's like, what are you saying again? You know, no, you know what, okay, it also applies when they're thinking, wait a second, and then they tell me. And then, if this, is, this is happening, it's between yeah. them and themselves. Yeah. It's just highlighting, uh, it's uh, highlighting. Uh, <laughs> He's making excuses for it. He's like, it works. Yeah, it, was, it actually works. <laughs> and there was a scene that I cannot forget. It was one of the Khadija actresses. And of course, you know, she wakes up in the morning full makeup. And you know, that, we know that. It just it happens all the time. But the thing is it's that she was, yeah. Yeah, she was thinking, okay? And they, of course, they're showing her beautiful face and the camera zoomed in. But then they showed her from the side. I was like, oh, no way, they're not showing her face. But then the camera went down and there's a mirror that reflects her face. <laughs> Like about two minutes, just the camera going all the way down and switching the mirror and you see her face. She's thinking oh, okay. deeply. That's great. <laughs> we have a long way to go for sure. <laughs> we do. Uh, we'll start taking questions from the audience now. Just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you.